Yeah, thank you, Dave, and thank you for uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's a great it's a great opportunity to come talk about how we think GOZAR might um, provide some beneficial information for severe weather operations because indeed we're quite certain that it will. Um, so this should be a pretty fun and easy talk. Um, I do have quite a quite a bit of eye candy as well. Um, a lot of what I want to talk about is using GOZAR in severe weather operations. I think that that's that's kind of the heart of, of what we want to do with this satellite. Um, so that'll be a lot of my examples. And um, I think that this presentation should complement the last few presentations um, fairly well. And I really like the discussion that we had. Um, I think that there's a lot of good questions and a lot of answers that we definitely don't know. The satellite's not up yet. So um, a lot of neat things that we're going to find out. Um, most of my career was in the National Weather Service. Um, I just recently moved to OAR, to the Office of Atmospheric Research Global Systems Division. But prior to that, for about 25 years, I was in the National Weather Service. And for 15 of those years, I was the Science and Operations Officer at the National Weather Service Office in Omaha, Nebraska. So that's the Central Plains. It's near and dear to my heart in terms of severe weather. It was our bread and butter. And, um, you know, we really um, were trying to do anything that we possibly could. To, to try to get improved lead time and lower false alarm, improved detection um, for severe weather. As I mentioned, um, let me go ahead and advance the slide here, <laughs> one way or the other. Looks like the arrows don't work, but this will, hopefully. There we go. That's doing it, I think. <laughs> okay, so um, as I mentioned, severe thunderstorms were a big deal um, for most of my career. Um, I've got in this image here a picture of a tornado that occurred um, up in northeast Nebraska. Um, it's called the Pilger Tornado. That's the town that um, it moved through and did a lot of damage to. This is a unique event because there were a couple of F EF4 tornadoes that were on the ground at the same time, and, and there were four EF4 tornadoes with this storm. Um, and again, like I mentioned, you know, it really tears us up if we were to miss something like this, um, if we only got a few minutes of lead time. Uh, so it's really pa we're really passionate about trying to find any tool that we can kind of put in the toolbox that would allow us to to make sure that we get good lead time on these storms, get good detection on them, and just have a much better feel for what those storms are doing now and what they're capable of doing in the future. So that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about again in terms of helping us understand um, the storm evolution and how goes are can really help us get a better feel for that. As we know, severe thunderstorms, um, they're really dynamic. They uh, can be very explosive in their development. They can evolve very rapidly. They can dissipate very rapidly. They're fairly detailed, a lot of small features that we have sometimes a difficult time understanding and seeing and watching evolve. And we've learned that the cloud tops can really reveal a lot of great information about the storm structure and about, uh, again, what that, what that thunderstorm could be capable of. Um, the overshooting top is a great, uh, uh, it's a, it's a great um, top part of the, of the updraft. And then we have um, a lot of other features that can really help us get a good feel for, uh, again, the evolution of the thunderstorm and how strong or severe it could be. And I'll show a quick example about how we're also able to get a sense now of supercell rotation with um, satellite imagery, which we really haven't been able to do too much before. As we know, traditionally, uh, we've, we've really leaned on radar data for most of our severe weather prediction, and it's done a great job. Um, but it's not perfect. Uh, one of our big uh, problems, as you can see there, is the, the limited coverage. Um, even that storm that I showed with the tornado in northeast Nebraska, you know, the lowest angle for the radar was around 9,000 feet above ground level. Um, so, you know, that's not, uh, that's pretty much in the northern part of Tornado Alley, and we still don't get that good of radar coverage in that area. So a lot of room for improvement uh, with observations. In addition to that, you know, we pretty much need hydrometeors for the radar to, uh, to detect and tell us what's happening. And so we have to wait for the precipitation to develop, and then the radar can give us some indication. But as we know, we can see some things prior to that um, with satellite. And as we've seen many examples already, um, Cooling and warming of the cloud tops can have a really, um, a really nice indication of the intensity of the storm. And our goal, again, as, as has been mentioned, is not necessarily to, to say radar or satellite. Why don't we combine radar and satellite and lightning and every other kind of observation that we have and NWP together? 
So that's really our goal, is to try to combine as much information as we can get our hands on to make as, as good a decision, decisions as possible. And I think the theme of the day is probably uh, one minute imagery. And I know that uh, Tim Schmidt showed uh, this, this map up here. And again, this is just an example. These one minute mesosectors um, can be moved around. And if there is a lot of severe weather happening, you can bet that one of them at least will be over that severe weather. So um, we've got a pretty good chance of, of having the one minute or maybe even 30 second imagery when we've got um, especially active severe weather. And again, can give us great indications of convective initiation and, and also um, anvil top characters. So what we've learned so far, we've really had to learn from uh, the Himawari data, which again, we've seen quite a bit of that imagery. It's two minute updates, but it's the same resolution as the ABI, as GOES are. And we also, of course, have the, the GOES 14 super rapid scan, one minute updates, but the lower resolution. So obviously, we'll be able to combine the one minute updates with the higher resolution that we see. I'm going to just zoom in on that uh, Himawari infrared image just to show that we can see so much detail that we couldn't see before with the evolving thunderstorms. There's a lot of features, especially in, the, uh, in, in some of the overshooting top areas. This is a pretty fast loop, so it's hard to see some of those, but um, really able to see a lot more than we could before in the infrared. And a couple of things that we're especially looking for, we talked a lot about overshooting tops, but um, there is the, in, the, uh, the en enhanced V feature and the thermal couplet. And a couple of examples from uh, SIMS here um, where we're able to uh, see the overshooting top here, which is quite cold, and contrast that with the fairly warm uh, wake area. And that's that thermal couplet, and the enhanced V shows up quite well uh, in addition to that. And then these are actually uh, AVHRR and then MODIS, MODIS uh, imagery here, so it's really high resolution. And we wouldn't be able to see this with geostationary satellite imagery, um, but we will get a much better feel for this when we do get to GOZAR. And then something that we've been doing in the Weather Service offices is fusing the infrared imagery with the visible imagery. So that allows us to see the high detail that we get with the visible imagery, but also see um, the thermal data from the IR imagery. And of course, you know, with all of these examples, keep in mind that um, what we're going to get is four times the resolution. So even though these are great, we get a lot of information out of them, and we can see a lot of features like the overshooting tops, the thermal couplets, and so forth. We should be able to see them even better when we have resolution at four times of what this imagery is. Cooling cloud tops has been mentioned, but I thought this was another great example of that. Um, on the left, a little bit difficult to see, but um, this is fairly rapid cloud top cooling. And notice the time at 1610Z. And then on the right, this is 1622Z, so it's 12 minutes later, and we're just now starting to see a little hint from the radar. So we're getting our first 35 dBZ echo. That's 12 minutes after we saw that cloud top cooling with um, our infrared imagery. And then on the right, it's 1735 before that storm um, is really becoming uh, quite strong to severe. And um, again, we had that indication back at 1610. Just again, more evidence showing that cloud top cooling can be especially useful and really give us some good information about the updraft characteristics. So this is brand new research, well, fairly new, and it's from the University of Alabama Huntsville. And I think it has a lot of promise. We haven't really seen this, this type of application before. And there's been some talk about the atmospheric motion vectors on the one minute imagery and how much uh, finer detail we can see with those. And what these researchers are doing is showing they're computing divergence every minute and vorticity every minute. So it's divergence on the left and vorticity on the right. And we're actually able to see rotation that's at the top of the supercell thunderstorms. So again, combining that with the rotation that you might see on radar can give us a much bigger picture of, of what that supercell is trying to do. This is not operational yet, um, and I'm not really sure when it will be, but um, I think that, uh, the, again, it's, it's promising enough to where um, we'll be doing what we can to get this into the hands of the forecasters and uh, let them help use that for um, enhancing their decision making. All right, so what I'm going to do now is, is kind of step you back through um, what we call a day in the life using one minute satellite imagery 
And this was a kind of a neat little experiment that I got to participate in. It was at the, um, the National Weather Service's OPG, or Operations Proving Ground, in Kansas City. This is kind of a neat facility. Basically, it allows us to put together a WFO, like a mock WFO, staff it like you might, same types of workstations, same data, and you can obviously run experiments using different types of data, of data such as one-minute imagery. And the question was, you know, is this more than eye candy? Is it really um, something that we can truly use to make our warning decisions? And will it be beneficial? Can we get more lead time? Can we get better POD? So several people spent um, a week in the OPG here, and we used live data. And we worked the severe weather event day after day after day. Fortunately, we did have a lot of really nice severe weather, and, and we could move around to wherever we wanted in the country. So it's not like we just had to be in Kansas City. And again, we had some great cases. Um, it was the first week in June. There's a lot of severe weather, typically, the first week of June. And again, that was our question. Can we issue warnings with this data? Not necessarily alone, but combining it with other data. And I'm going to go through a few examples of this. this is, again, I'm going to stick with June 4th here. And this is early in the morning. This is uh, 12Z to 1445Z. And on all of these loops, the time is fairly important. So we'll kind of pay close attention to that. So this is when the sun's coming up, and we're kind of seeing that morning convection, and there's already quite a bit going on. Um, and again, this is data every one minute. A lot of convective development in northeast uh, Kansas and southeast Nebraska. So we'll focus on that first. And this is a typical radar type of display that we would use in a forecast office for issuing warnings. In this example, we've got visible imagery in the upper left, infrared imagery in the upper right, and then in this case, we went with just half degree reflectivity lower left, and then a half, de uh, half degree uh, differential reflectivity, or ZDR, in the lower right, which is somewhat helpful for detecting hail. The first thing you might notice is that even though the radar temporal resolution is pretty good, it's what we're used to, about every five minutes, now we're seeing the satellite resolution faster. So we're getting more and more updates. We're filling in the gaps between the radar data with satellite data. Imagine that. And there's a lot of structure taking place in those one-minute updates. In addition to this, this is a case where, again, this is kind of a early to, or rather mid to late morning. It's 1505Z to 17Z. And the radar is, you know, fairly strong, but it's not overly impressive. You know, these are not uh, really giant uh, supercells moving through Kansas. So, um, it's a little bit of a mystery as to what these, might, what these might do. We'll zoom in a little bit. We'll go to the time of 1555Z to 1615Z. This is, again, over northeast Kansas. And it looks like that visible imagery, the, it's a little bit washed out, so you can't see um, the, the contrast as well um, as we might see on our workstations. But you can see a little bit of the bubbling of the overshooting top. I'll kind of point that out here with the mouse. And that does correspond with this um, infrared cooling that we're seeing. And again, at the radar level, we're seeing some interesting storm activity, but nothing that would really, um, you know, really grab your attention as to, wow, that's a, a super severe thunderstorm. Um, but right at the end of this loop, we did have 1.75 inch hail. This was a storm that went unwarned. And again, I think a large part of that was because the radar data didn't show anything all that significant. And we're also seeing that towards the end of the loop, we are seeing the cloud tops cooling a little bit. Um, so I think that's a case in which we had the hail development and the hail creation with the updraft early on, and then it dropped the hail, and then we saw the cloud tops cool a little bit. Going a little bit later, 1645 to 17Z, and we're seeing something similar. In this case, this was, um, this was asked about before, you know, do we ever see cases where there's not much of an indication in the IR? And yeah, we occasionally do. And I think another issue with this is, is, again, the color enhancement can make a big difference. If we had this color enhancement a little bit different, we might be able to see some different features or some different trends. Um, this was also a case in which we had two-inch hail. And again, it's tough to see the contrast in the white uh, infrared, or rather visible imagery, but there is some, some bubbling of the overshooting tops there. All right, so we're going to move away from that and go a little bit later in the day. This is uh, just late morning, 16Z uh, to 1730Z, so close to noon, kind of zooming out a little bit just to sort of see the, the big convective environment. And again, quite a bit going on. We can see the convection in northeast Kansas um, that's weakening a little bit, but it hasn't completely weakened. It's hanging on, and it's moving off to the southeast. 
So now we're going to focus on this area of Nebraska here, central Nebraska, where we've got some new convective development going on. There's also a lot of sort of junky clouds. There's a lot of low-level clouds, and, and we can see some high-level clouds going on in there. And so I think the question is, um, you know, what will those storms end up doing? So zooming in on that a little bit, this is again sort of central southern Nebraska. Um, we're able to see that convection develop up here. And we also have a little bit of an indication of a boundary in there, but it's a little bit tough to tell where. But more importantly, we can see that the low level, the like surface-based flow, is out of the southeast. It's moving off to the northwest. And it does appear that the new convection is up above that. It's moving kind of north-northeast, which would indicate that that's more of an elevated type of a convective threat. So elevated convection generally doesn't produce tornadoes. Um, it can be prolific hail producers, but often not um, tornadoes. So that alone tells us um, you know, what to expect from those. A little bit later in time, 1735 to 1940Z, um, this is just later in the evolution. We can see those storms that we were looking at before that developed and moved off to the northeast here. And then we've got some new convection down here. Um, a little bit tougher to know if this is elevated or not. But as we see, they do continue to move off to the northeast away from that southeast low-level flow, again, indicating that it's closer to being elevated than it would be surface-based. And just looking at this loop, you can see so much going on in here. These are actually upper-level um, cirrus clouds moving around a ridge, so they're moving from south to north. Moving on a little bit later in the day, this is 18Z to 1859Z, so it's one hour uh, worth of radar data, or rather satellite data. And now we're going to focus mostly in the high plains. You can see out here, convection is starting to develop in southeast Wyoming and over northern Colorado. So we'll take a look at that area, see what we can see. We'll go back to a, a typical four panel that we would use in a forecast office's uh, workstations. And this is a brand new supercell that's developing over the high plains. And again, a little bit tough to see, but there's a lot of overshooting top activity. This is pretty explosive development here. We're starting to see uh, the, the cloud tops cool pretty well in the infrared. And then again, this is a high plains event, so we don't have a lot of moisture out there. So our, our, our storms are typically more of the H, or rather the, the LP, low precipitation variety. But um, you, know, you can definitely see storms developing, and they're starting to show a little bit of a mesocyclone in the reflectivity. Um, but it's just so much additional detail that we're seeing with that explosive updraft in the one minute imagery um, there. So now we're just going to take a 10 minute window from 2000, or uh, not 2005, but 2005Z to 2015Z. So it's just 10 minutes. And again, you know, we know that right now we get a picture every 15 minutes. So within that period of time, in just 10 minutes, we're going to see quite a bit of evolution in the storm structure here. So we're seeing the overshooting tops continue to strengthen here, cloud tops continue to cool a bit, and our storm is fairly strong. It's actually producing pretty big hail, about two-inch hail at this time. But right in here, we see this little feature that kind of pokes out from the southern part of the storm. And again, it's the type of thing where you need that one-minute imagery to sort of see it, the, see it evolve and see it, it come out. And what is that feature? And, and we, frankly, had no idea when we first saw this, but we thought it was interesting. And then if we move ahead, a little bit later to 2020, and we just uh, look at not an animation but a still frame. Um, this is the storm here, and we can see that just starting to poke out the, the, the southern part of the storm. Just looking at the rest of the structure, we can see a pretty cold overshooting top. We can see the uh, warmer um, thermal couplet, and th at this point, the storms on radar are fairly strong. And then moving ahead to 2005 to 2141, we're going to watch the evolution of this little feature that I mentioned. Again, we're not really sure what that, what that was at the time. But a couple other interesting things happen. Again, we've got nice, uh, strong new development in the updraft here. The IR continues to show the cold overshooting top. But look what's happening to our reflectivity in the radar. It's weakening quite a bit. And if you stare at this long enough, you can see that basically you've got some subsidence occurring as this little feature moves off to the south. It appears to push a little bit of a wave down to the south, and we see that Q start to dissipate. So we've actually got subsidence occurring from the southern part of the supercell, which is corresponding to that weakening reflectivity. And this is what we're able to see with one-minute data. 
What exactly is this? It's probably mid-level outflow. Does it mean for sure that the storm will do this or that? I don't think we know yet, but we've never been able to see it before. So the fact that we can see it, we can start to ask these questions is really the point at this, at this stage. Um, but that's a pretty good hypothesis is that that mid-level outflow is causing some subsidence to occur. It's cutting off some of the low-level upflow or inflow and the storm is weakening. So things that we just weren't able to see before. Okay, and again, this is uh, our, just a still picture of the day. This is getting into the evening. And the place that we haven't really looked is uh, southwest Kansas. We kind of looked over here, we looked at this convection, and we looked over here. And this, by the way, in northeast Colorado really starts to take off, and it's kind of fun to look at, look at as well. So the next few loops, we'll see, um, we'll see that, but we'll also see um, what's happening in southwest Kansas. And really the point of this is to, to talk a little bit about convective initiation. And again, something that, that we've known a little bit about but haven't really been able to observe it that much until we had this one-minute imagery. You know, chasers used to talk about this notion of an orphan anvil. So you get an updraft and a nice convective tower, but then it just kind of goes poof and the anvil fades off to the, the east and you don't think very much of it. And the chasers are really disappointed because, of course, that wasn't the, the storm that went and, and uh, they can't chase it. Turns out that might be pretty important. And again, we've sort of seen this before anecdotally, but now we're able to see it, um, see it a little bit closer. So obviously the area of interest is this guy. This is the convective tower that we're talking about here. Tried to go, for whatever reason, that parcel wasn't able to make it up, up past the level of free convection and turn into a, a nice updraft. So at this point, it breaks away and just sort of fades off into the westerly flow. Now we're going to take that same loop and extend it further. So this is 2035Z all the way to 2300. And again, it continues to fade east. This is the area that we're talking about here. We'll watch that one more time. It blows up. We get the convective tower, but then it's not able to turn into a, a stronger updraft. It cuts away and it fades off to the east. What's happening with that? Is, is occurring. We know that, that there was precipitation up there, and as that's faded away, those hydrometeors evaporated. Maybe saw some virga if you were down on the ground looking at this. And what does evaporation, evaporational cooling do? It obviously cools those mid-levels. So if you've got a cap in place, that's a great opportunity to cool that cap, that capping inversion down just enough to allow your parcels to uh, go beyond the LFC. If we advance one more We'll see from, this, this is the, the, the start time of this was the end time of the last image here. And right in this area is where we get to see that, that take place. So that's where that previous uh, loop ended and this line of Q really fired up. I'm sure there were other reasons. There could have been some low level convergence. Um, obviously there's somewhat of a boundary there, but why there? Why not anywhere else along the boundary? And it seems like it's a, it's a nice, um, a nice correlation, and this isn't the only example of this that we've seen. We've seen this time after time when we were able to view the one-minute imagery. And then again, note this is getting close to sunset now. It ends at uh, close to zero Z. So then we go back to this um, this fused product of the visible imagery and the infrared imagery, and um, it's especially useful when we get into this kind of low light time where we can use that infrared imagery as well. Again, lots, lots going on here. This is a, a really active, active day. So again, that was with the OPG that we did that. There's been a lot of other activities that are very similar. Um, we've talked uh, today quite a bit about the Gozar Proving Ground. And it's just, when, when you think about all the different evaluations that have taken place on some of this data, um, it's kind of mind-boggling. And it's, you know, lots of different locations um, across the country. So we've learned a lot from that. Um, this is just a, a couple quick pictures of the hazardous weather test bed in Norman on the top, and then the aviation weather test bed in Kansas City on the bottom. Again, a lot of evaluations uh, done with, uh, with, with these two test beds, but several others as well. And one of the, the nicest uh, ways to, to, to look at the findings and look at the, the collaborations and the discussions that, that took place um, in, in the HWT in particular is through these, um, through these blogs. And there's been hundreds of these blogs that have been produced. And I really encourage you to go read through these because there were so many lessons learned. Um, lots of different topics, uh, lots of different uh, 
uh, different types of weather that, that were taking place. And so again, um, just a wide variety of things that were learned. I thought I would mention that uh, it's kind of neat. It's not just for the National Weather Service. We've had a number of broadcast meteorologists that have participated in the HWT, three here. Um, and I think that it was a really nice exchange of information. I know the Weather Service people learned a lot from the broadcasters. Sounds like the broadcasters might have learned quite a few things too. Um, and again, just an excellent opportunity. It sounds like um, the people in here that went would be able to attest to that um, to evaluate these products. Just a couple quick um, quotes from some of the participants in the HWT. Um, this is the one minute temporal resolution allows for visual tracking of those individual small convective cell development. Just can't see that in the 15 minute imagery. Um, kept me ahead of the game and then that last quote was very helpful in seeing dud updrafts, basically what I was just talking about there. This is another quote. Um, in this, in this uh, particular loop you can really see that boundary moving south uh, through the imagery. And the forecaster mentioned that uh, the data indicated the storm was elevated. Again, that's an extremely important point that we need to know about, uh, especially for uh, tornado genesis. It's really difficult to get tornadoes to form um, when that updraft is not rooted in the boundary layer. So it's really important to see that. We also evaluated the derived motion winds from the one minute imagery. And uh, again, a lot of good feedback from that. Um, zero to one kilometer shear. It's really important to know about that. And this gave participants a pretty good idea of that, as well as the deep layer shear, combining it with other derived, um, derived motion winds. Rob Severe has been talked about a lot. And there's a reason for it. It's, it's a big hit. Uh, in the National Weather Service, especially throughout the plains, um, it's an extremely popular product. And there's, a, again, a reason for that. Um, it's, it performs really well in a lot of cases. Not necessarily every case, but again, it's a really nice tool in the toolbox that gives us a, a little bit better lead time um, on, on severe storms. So I won't go into that too much. There are a lot of Gozar Baseline products. Um, we really haven't had a chance to evaluate these. Um, there's, we've been using the simulated data to come up with some of these, and I think that we're really eager to, to get our hands on, um, on these. You know, these are some simple ones like the derived stability indices, um, being able to see the CAPE and LI and so forth um, should provide a more complete picture as well. But there's other things about the cloud tops, cloud top temperature and cloud top pressure um, that we really haven't had a chance to, to evaluate. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, microphone. Um, the question was, is the snow cover part of the baseline? And I believe it is. Um, I can't guarantee it, but Tim sh uh, is shaking his head. So um, I think if it's on this slide, we think that it is part of that baseline product. Yep. I was just going to say, Dan Sapp for WBOC, when I first heard of that, I thought, that's crazy. You're not going to be able to tell me how many inches of snow were on the ground from 22,000 miles. And I'd like to say I was absolutely wrong. It was amazing. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. I really think that a lot of that is going to, we're going to see that through the, um, the RGBs and the multispectral imagery that we'll be able to create. All right, so just a quick summary slide. Um, again, as I mentioned um, at the beginning, there's no question that GOZAR will provide tremendous benefit to severe weather prediction and help us with our warnings a lot. Um, it'll help us from everything from convective initiation to the potential for the severity and especially through the explosive updrafts. Um, if we can get indications of supercell rotation that we can add to what we're seeing in the radar, that'll be a tremendous benefit as well. Storm motions, mergers, and redevelopment. Um, we need all the help we can get. As I mentioned, you know, we're doing okay, right? We hit a few um, and, and we get some really good 20 minute lead times on occasion. We like that. But we still have a long ways to go, and we, we want to get more lead time. We want to get more detection. Um, that's our bread and butter. We don't want to miss any, and, and we really feel like Gozar should be able to help us out a lot um, with that. Looks like I'm about out of time, so with that, I'll wrap it up and take any questions. Uh, Mike Mogul, uh, how the weather works, Naples, Florida, but well, we don't have too much in the way of severe weather. Um, how much lead time is too much 
Oh, how much lead time is too much? <laughs> well, that's a great question, and, and unfortunately, I don't think we, we know the answer to that. And I, it, it, it depends on so many factors that would thoroughly have to be researched, and I think it's more of a social science research question, and we just don't really know the answer. But I think to, you know, in my opinion, if we're only getting a couple minutes lead time on, on some of our tornadoes, that's probably not enough. You know, we, we would like to be able to get more. Um, I think it's a really valid question. It's just, you're right. It's, it's Let me rephrase. Okay. <laughs> Knowing that the time frame of every person in this room is measured in nanoseconds now, and you give a person out in the real world whose all time frame is also measured in nanoseconds, and say, in 35 minutes, a severe storm is going to roll into your community. Yeah. How much attention will they pay to that? If they're doing this, well, I, I, th I think that's it's, again, it's a question we simply don't know the answer to. But should we provide it if we could know it? I don't know. Maybe we should, and then people can decide wh what they want to do with it. And I really think I think that's really valid. Um, unfortunately, you know, I've been sitting in the hot seat at 3 a.m. and I don't have any spotters or chasers to tell me what's going on on the ground, and I've got junk convection out there, and I get a call of either a, a report of, or a report of hail or, you know, somebody's barn just got taken out by a tornado. And what do I do with that? And those are really difficult situations. And do I issue a warning? What's that storm look like? Maybe it's way out on the edge of my radar. And if that's the case, I don't have enough to make a good decision. So I want more information that would help me make that decision. That's a good question. <laughs> and I know you've been there too. <clears throat> trying to go home and weather service is cranking out these warnings and you're looking at that going, oh, really? <laughs> Dan, we have a question from an online uh, viewer through the webinar. Juan, we'll ask that question. Okay, great. This question is from John Craze. Uh, his question is, this is just giving us more information. It isn't taking any science or training off of us. Common sense will apply as well as knowledge of our environment. How will local weather personnel be trained to use all the new information we will get? Well, that's a great question. Um, if, it's, if it's for the National Weather Service, there has been, as was uh, mentioned before, there's, a, there's an eight-hour brand new course. Um, it's, it's called, uh, it's basically the foundational course for GOES-R. And it's really designed to bring everybody up to speed on these products and then um, a rough idea um, about, you know, what exactly we'll get from GOES-R and then how to utilize those. The nice thing of it is, is that's not just for the National Weather Service. Um, it's, it's open to others as well. So there's a lot of training that's being developed. And I think like in these cases here, you know, if you just threw one minute data at somebody and said, here, use this for issuing warnings, that's, that's asking a lot. But I think the idea is to, try, to tr really try to train people to use this in combination with other data um, and, and then help, help make those decisions. But training is the key, and, and, and a lot of training development is underway. Okay. And that training is available on the MedEd website. That's right. Training is available on the MedEd web website. And I think, like I mentioned, I, th I think that's been covered a little bit. Yeah. Thanks, Lon. Do we have any other questions in the room? Daniel, thanks very much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.